I'm so glad you're at Christ's place today. I love the traditions of Christmas. We've done a lot of the Christmas carols that we love, and I want to read the Christmas story today. So I'm going to read from the Bible, from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, and you may be reading this tomorrow at your house or maybe tonight, the famous Christmas story. I won't read it all, but I do want to read the first seven verses. So listen to the word of God as I read it out loud. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. This was the first registration when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid the baby Jesus in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. I don't know if you traveled to get here today. Some of you came from out of town. Some of us may be traveling in the next few days So traveling this year will be 35% higher than it was last year. And last year was kind of crazy. We know about that. Like 110 million people traveled during the Christmas season. And any of us that get in a car or get in a van or however you travel on an airplane, it can really be exhausting at times. Especially if you have a member of your family and they are a road warrior and they do not believe in potty breaks. Is there anyone in your house like that? They should get coal in their stocking, right? Because there's a lot of dads probably in the room and you get in your wife's minivan, minivan you become Mario Andretti. I know who you are. And so you, you know, this road warrior, you take these trips and I don't know how you feel, but when I was a kid, my dad didn't stop much. We were from Jacksonville, Florida. And every year we traveled to Augusta, Georgia to see my grandparents. And so we'd travel up I-95 up toward that way. And we knew where dad would always stop. Coming home, we knew that the place that we would always stop so we could get like, you know, a pee-pee break and something to eat was uh, exit 7B in Brunswick. And so exit 7B is where the golden arches were. And it looked like heaven, McDonald's. And we'd be coming through, heading south to Jacksonville. And we couldn't wait for our exit B when we could get out of the car and stretch our legs and go to the bathroom and eat. Now that I'm a man and we travel, we've got different places we stop. And I learned about a new place that has become our stop. And I don't know if you've heard about this place. Have you heard about this incredible place called Bucky's? Can I get a witness in the church house? <laughs> Hallelujah for Bucky's. Now they came out of Texas and they're slowly coming over here to the Holy Land, Georgia and you know, Alabama and Florida. So we got two in Georgia, got one in Calhoun, got one in Warner Robins. There's a few in Florida, a few in Alabama. And I'm telling you, Bucky's is amazing. There's like 120 gas pumps Now, the problem, you still have to wait because someone's in there shopping and you can spend an hour in that place. So it is a jacked up gas station. It is convenience store heaven. It is the interstate target for rednecks, I'm telling you. (laughs) I got on their website this afternoon or earlier this morning, rather, and learned about all the things you can, you can flat do your Christmas. If you haven't done your Christmas shopping, head on down to Warner Robins right now. Listen to what they sell at Bucky's, beef jerky, can I get a witness? Hot sauce, beaver nuggets, their specialty. Beef brisket, nanner pudding, flavored popcorn. You can even get Christmas ornaments, home decor, a grill, and even clothes. They even got swimming suits. So next time you're going to a water park, you don't have to worry about a bathing suit. You need to worry about one, but 
get one, get it at Bucky's. So I was there recently and we pulled in there and I was a little tired and I saw this chewing gum I bought and this chewing gum I bought there at Bucky's was called Rev. And the reason I bought it, I'm a Rev. I'm a reverend, so I thought it's for clergymen, I guess, you know. I didn't know that this chewing gum will rev your engine up. So I'm going to tell you, every morning in my life, I drink a five-hour energy shot at five o'clock. They'll be in my stocking tomorrow. Santa's going to bring me energy shots. I get them every year. I'm telling you, when you, when you try some Rev gum at Bucky's, it's like drinking seven five-hour energy shots. And so there's a lot of anticipation when you get to that place called Bucky's after a long journey. Well, in Luke 2, they're all exhausted too as they are traveling, but there's not a Bucky's in sight. When you get to Luke 2, the shepherds, they, they travel to worship Jesus. And, and the wise men, we learned it's central. Pastor Rick preached about the wise men, and he, he was teaching us from the Bible that they traveled like two years to get to the place to worship Jesus. And, and Joseph and Mary, we read about them this afternoon. So they traveled so that she could be in Bethlehem to give birth to Jesus. And you know how far they traveled? 90 miles. So they weren't in a van. They were not in a nice automobile. She probably rode a donkey and it was a long trip. So some of you might be getting an Apple watch for Christmas and if you do, you count steps, right? So if Mary had an Apple watch on, the steps that they would have taken to get to Bethlehem would have been like 80,000 steps. And I'm sure women that have had babies, her feet were swollen and her body hurt everywhere. The Bible says she was great with child. I think it's awesome that when we open up the Bible at church this Christmas Eve, we see that, that God is so wonderful in his creation. God makes no mistakes in how he designed everything and how God was so good to design two distinct genders. You know the genders that God created, male and female, they are beautiful in God's design. And it makes me so angry at the devil, how he wants to deceive people in this beautiful design of God, that he, he made a man and he made a woman, and we can celebrate the uniqueness that a male and a female, how they're different and how God wired them and made them. And you can even see it in the Christmas story. Mary, she was a woman, and only women can have babies. Men cannot have babies. Only a woman can conceive and give birth to a child. And, and you ladies out there that are moms and you've had babies, I admire you because you are tough as nails. I mean, to go through childbirth and, and all of that experience. And here Mary was very much pregnant. And in just a few moments, she would give birth to a baby. And in the womb that, that the Holy Spirit uh, brought a about that pregnancy, there was a living being within her. So in every mother, every woman that, that has a baby within her, that is a living being. That is a living soul. And we celebrate life this Christmas Eve. And so here's Mary and she's about to give birth to a child, her first child. And then you have the other gender God made, the man. And, and we're so thankful for, for her husband, Joseph. The Bible says in Matthew 1:19 that he was a good husband. He was a good man to his wife, Mary. And I want to just speak to all the husbands in the, the room. You know, just don't be sweet and nice to your wife on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Give the gift that keeps on giving and treat her with dignity and respect and love and value the wife of your youth. And so, so God made the man as a husband to be the provider and the protector. And he is, he is protecting his wife. He is providing for her. And I'm just thinking if I were in the sandals of Joseph, how I would feel for my wife that is about to give birth to, the, uh, to their firstborn. She, it's not comfortable. It was a long journey. And I'm certain he was real concerned. I remember when our uh, first child was born. It was in the time that you didn't have cell phones. And if you were uh, expected, 
a couple, you had a pager. Anybody in the house have a pager? And, and, and so anytime Becky paged me, I know uh, it, it's about to happen. You know, we got a boogie on the Gainesville, Florida for the birth of our, our daughter. And so Joseph, he's so concerned. And you can just feel the frustration of Joseph. Any man can feel this if you love your wife and your children. So you get into Bethlehem and he's looking for somewhere for them to be able to have a nice comfy place for Mary to give birth to Jesus. And everywhere he went, he would see this sign in the window, no vacancy, no vacancy. And every dude in the room right now understands if you love your wife and you love your children, you want things right for them, right? Amen, guys. You want to make sure they're, t guys, y'all leaving me up here alone. Oh my goodness. Next time do better. So, you know, he's wanting everything just right for her and you could just feel the frustration. Now, I did see a cute cartoon, and if you're married, you would appreciate this. It's up on the screen. The real reason it was a silent night, how many times do I have to say, I'm sorry, baby. I forgot to make reservations at the end, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, but when we do silent night, when we light the candles, it was not about Mary pouting with Joseph, I promise. But it was a real tough first Christmas as they found no place for her to be able to give birth. I remember when Becky and I were celebrating our 10th wedding anniversary and I had this perfect, perfect trip planned out. I surprised her on this trip and we uh, traveled down to sunny Florida and I rented a fun car to drive and I had us reservations in the nicest hotel we've ever stayed in. And I'm, boy, I just, I just felt so confident. I was so excited about this trip for our 10th anniversary. So I tell her to wait in the car. I'm gonna go in and let them know the crooks are here, you know, and let, give them my name and they'll show us to our suite. And I just said, you just, you just wait on Hubba Bubba, I'll be back. And so, you know, just wait. And so I go in there and so I, I say my name and they didn't have me in their reservation system. The woman that made the reservation when I called, she put it for the next week, not this week. And I'm telling you, I, I, I turned as red as the Christmas ornament on your tree. And I, I did not talk like a preacher that day at the hotel, I'm telling you. It was bad. But let me tell you what they did. They got us in another sister hotel, and it was okay. We had somewhere nice to stay. But come up close and hear this. Not for Joseph and Mary. Because the Bible says there was no place for them in the inn. And so there was no nice place for her to give birth to the firstborn, to the Son of God. Why wasn't there room? Well, the innkeeper said no room. Who was the innkeeper? Boy, let's get a rock and stone him. Well, hold on, time out. We don't know anything about him. So oftentimes we make this innkeeper look like, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge or the Grinch. And it may have been totally legit. He had no room for them. He just could not have a place for them to go. But I tell you, it definitely warrants us for the next few moments, and it's a few moments because I know we all got places to go and fun things to do. But for a few moments, there's a few lessons that you need to hear really to get us ready for communion in a moment about the innkeeper having no room and what it means for all of us. So what I want to do, I want to give you a couple quick lessons, and I want to start from the least and move to the greatest. And here's the first thing I'd like to say this afternoon to you. Look for ways to be generous, hospitable, and kind. So all we know is the innkeeper said, no room for you. Wouldn't it be awesome if the innkeeper said, all we have is our bedroom, but we're going to give it to you all? He would have become the hero of the story, right? But for some reason, there was no room for Mary, Joseph, or the child to be born, the Son of God, our Savior. And I think today we can learn something that this is an opportunity for us to think about ways to share, to open up our hearts, to open up our homes, to open up our lives to other people. You know, you never know who God might send your way for a reason. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, to people you don't know, for thereby some have entertained angels and they didn't even know it. Next time you're rude to somebody, you might be ticking Gabriel off. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, the Christmas story, there's angels everywhere. 
And so when God sends someone your way, it may be an angel. It may be someone that God sent because he wants you to learn something from them. He may send someone aggravating into your life during the holidays so he can teach you how to love aggravating people. He may bring someone into your life that doesn't have the blessings that you have so you can be a conduit and you can share and you can bless them. Or maybe God is going to send someone your way because he wants them to see the love of Jesus Christ through your generosity, hospitality, and kindness. So don't be rude. Now, I know you're thinking, well, Pastor Jeff, everybody's nice at Christmas. I get it. How come we're more holy in the holidays? Shouldn't we always be nice to people? Shouldn't we always be courteous? I mean, what do we call this? Christmas, Christ must. What's it about Christ living through us? So I just want to challenge you tonight and tomorrow. Look for ways to share, to show love, to build up, to affirm, not to throw shade at people. Look for someone during the Christmas break that you can be nice to, that you can show the love of Jesus Christ to. You have no idea how God will use your life. And when we go into next year, 2022, go meet some new neighbors. Go build some new friendships. Just don't let the magical Christmas pixie dust make you nice during this time of the year. Let's move into the next year making room for other people in our life. The Apostle Paul once said this, make room for us in your hearts. And I think it's so powerful when you make room for other people. And I'll tell you this, the best place to learn to do that is in your own family. Because if, we, if we're not nice to one another in our family, we can't live that out wherever God takes us. Here's another lesson I want you to see this afternoon. Have you made room for Jesus Christ in your heart? So in verse seven, it says that the innkeeper said, no room. There was no room for Mary, Joseph, or Jesus. I love the traditional Christmas carols. We did, we did many of those this afternoon. When I was a kid, you know what my favorite Christmas carol was? Joy to the world. And I think it was because it didn't sound like a funeral dirge. I mean, it was peppy and perky and upbeat. And here's some of the words of the carol. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. I love, the, I love this line that Isaac Watts wrote when he wrote the hymn. Let every heart prepare him room. So Christmas Eve, have you made room for Jesus Christ in your life? There may be someone here this afternoon, you hadn't been to a church this whole year for whatever reason. Let me tell you this, I am so happy you're here. I'm just so thankful that you are in church at Christ's place. Maybe there's someone here and you no longer believe in God. Something bad happened to you. Maybe your loved one died and this is the first Christmas without them. Or maybe you prayed so many prayers to God about something and you don't think God hears you. So you have said, God, you're kicked out of my life. You, you evicted God from your heart. You said, leave me alone. And no longer, I mean, you know, you love your family, you love Christmas, but Jesus is really not high up on your list. I want to plead with you today, make room for God in your life. Because God loves you. And that's what Christmas is about, that God became man. God became like us, yet without sin, and loved us and made room for us in his heart. And Jesus wants to enter your life. There's a scripture in the book of Revelation. You know that last book of the New Testament? It goes like this. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and share a meal together as friends. I love that verse because Jesus wants to be a friend to you and he wants to have a relationship with you and he wants to fellowship with you, but you've got to make room in your heart. And I don't know, maybe there's some stuff in your heart that's crowded out Jesus. Maybe some terrible addiction and you keep telling everybody that loves you, I'm okay, I'm okay, I got it under control. And they're watching you and they're like, dude, he's unraveling. They just see you out of control. Could it be maybe that in your heart, 
you've got some bitterness towards somebody that did something mean to you this year, and you've got so much hate in your heart that you've evicted God out of your life, this Christmas Eve, make room for God to come into your life. There's a book that I, I would love to recommend to you. You can go on Amazon. If you order it tonight, it won't be there tomorrow. But anyway, uh, Robert Munger wrote a book called My Heart, Christ Home. It's like a couple bucks. It's a great read for next year. And the whole book is about your heart, your life, and Jesus Christ living in your life, and you let him go anywhere. So do you have family staying with you at Christmas? you have anybody visiting? So what do you do when family comes? You make sure that there's bath towels in the bathroom, right? You make sure there's plenty of toilet paper. Make sure there's a bar of soap. You make sure you got plenty of food. You make sure that you've changed the sheets from when they saw you last Christmas, right? It'd be kind of tacky if you didn't. What are you doing? You're making it nice for them. You're, le you're letting them, my home, your home. You're saying, welcome. If we do that for our loved ones, why would we not do that for Jesus Christ that loves us? It's called lordship. And the best gift you can give Jesus this Christmas is an open-handed life saying, you're my master, my Lord, and I want to follow you. I want to make room in my heart for you. I think there's one more lesson before we take communion, and, and it would be this from Luke chapter 2. And it, here it is. Jesus Christ has made room for you. Jesus Christ has made room for you. Now, think about this. There was no room for Jesus when his when his mother, his birth mother, and, and, and his dad while he's on the earth came to find a place for him to be born, that guy said, no room. But here, Jesus didn't grow up to be cynical and bitter and mad. Of course, he's the son of God, he's perfect. But he made room for us. Listen to what the angels told the shepherd, Luke 2, 10. I bring you good news of great joy, and it will be for all the people. No one left out. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So, you know, Christmas is fun. I mean, we have a good time with ho, ho, ho and all that fun stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. The real meaning of Christmas is Jesus is a Savior. He's our Savior. And what does that mean when Jesus is our Savior? It means that he made room for you and he made room to forgive you of your sins. Jesus Christ made room to forgive you of all your sins. You're like, well, are there many sinners in the room? The building is full of sinners today at Christ's place. I know we talk about the nice list and the naughty list, but here's the, here's the deal. On your best day, you're still naughty, and I am too. It's called sin. And so Jesus Christ came to forgive us of our sin. Matthew 1, 21, Mary will bear a son, and you're gonna call his name Jesus, and he will save their people from their sin. And so that's the message of Christmas, that the Lord forgives us of what we've done. And we've all done shameful things. You know, when, when, when I was a kid, I was like a kid of the 70s and 80s. We weren't giving out electronics. What, we got cool gifts like Etch-A-Sketch. You might get an Etch-A-Sketch. Man, that was the bomb.com, I'm telling you, the Etch-A-Sketch. Come on, you old timers out there, help me out. And so you draw something with the little wheels, you know, you draw, Grandma, this looks like you. Woo! you know, and anyway, and so if it looked real bad and you didn't like it, what did you do to get rid of it? Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. And then you had a clean slate. Jesus Christ will do an etch-a-sketch on any heart in this room today. Whatever shame you have, guilt you have, sin I have, that's why we need Christmas and a Savior. He made room to forgive us. He also made room to take us to heaven. Heaven is not a small place, it's a big place. John 14 says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. So God has a place called heaven and we're gonna get to go there when we die. If we know Jesus, he's made room and no one will be left out. There's room for every single person that is a believer because Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said, this is how much room I have in heaven. That's how much room I have in heaven. And he stretched out his arms and died. He's making room for you. And here's the thing about heaven. For anyone to go to heaven, they've got to be real intentional to get there. What I mean by that is that they've got to make room in their life to say, Jesus, 
I want you to be my Savior. Because, see, the, the only Savior that can save you is not money or the government. For crying out loud, isn't that a joke? Anyway, uh, there's no Savior apart from Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said this about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to God, the Father in heaven, except through me. So can we just time out for a moment before we take communion? And can I just ask you something? Have you made room for Jesus in your family, your marriage, your life, college student, your home for the holidays? Have you made room for Jesus Christ in your young heart? You hear a lot of stuff at college, a lot of theories, a lot of ideas, but there is something called absolute truth, and this is what it means. There's the God who created you. You're made in the image of God, and the only life that makes sense is the life that has Jesus Christ indwelling in it. And he wants to come into your life today. I'm just gonna invite anybody right now. I did this in the two o'clock service that would like to receive Jesus Christ as their savior. I'd like to invite you to do that. Would you do something with me? Can we all do this real quick? Can we bow our heads? And I'm gonna pray. And if there's anyone this Christmas Eve afternoon that would like to begin a relationship with Jesus, you pray in your heart when I'm praying out loud. Pray now, Jesus Christ, thank you for making room for me. And right now, I'm making room for you. I need a Savior. I need Jesus. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and be my Savior this Christmas Eve afternoon. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.